Hey, everybody, and welcome to episode number four of the fourth season of the Fantasy Fullback Dive, brought to you by the good folks at the Rota Street Journal. We are paving your way to fantasy glory, even though the time for that is over. Mm. Uh, although we're already waist deep in a 2019 mock draft. So we start paving early here at the Rota Street Journal. The paving starts in early January, and then by August, when the drafts roll around, the road is so nicely paved. <laughs> Your way is so well blocked. You're just going to waltz right through that hole. You're going to look like Sony Michelle. I was and just going to say, like Sony Michelle <laughs> dicing up the Chiefs. Great minds think alike, my man. Great minds often do think alike. Uh, alike. Anyway, uh, my name is Nat The Truth Jones. With me, as always, the Wolf of Rota Street himself. We've been off for like a week and a half, two weeks. To me, it feels like months. Like I can't even remember how to use my equipment. The fan on my computer is on right now, buzzing. So if you hear a really unpleasant static, that's what it is. It will probably go away soon. We'll see what happens. If not, you know, maybe we've lost you as a listener, but I sure hope not. Anyway, Wolf, how you doing? I'm doing fantastic, man. We're fresh off probably the best championship weekend I've ever seen that maybe has ever been recorded in football history. Unbelievable weekend of football. Can't wait to recap that with you. Uh, We've got, as you mentioned, the mock draft. We did the first two rounds a week and a half or so ago. And as you said, that feels like it was literally a whole different era, Uh, especially the New England just like ridiculous cold one day. Now it's 55 degrees. Like I I don't get what the hell's happening. It seems like we're three seasons apart at this point. Uh, But either way, it's been it's been an unbelievable run. My fucking Patriots, baby, heading to the Super Bowl. So excited, so fucking pumped the way this team's playing. So I can't wait to talk about them. Can't wait to recap those rounds three through six or so of the mock draft. We'll see how many we get through, what we decide to, to really zoom in on. I got some storylines, some lessons learned already that I can't wait to discuss to discuss with everybody and then i know next week we'll kind of dive more into the super bowl preview doing the prop bets and whatnot and the prop bets oh absolutely. yeah absolutely um so yeah i mean tons tons to discuss really excited to get back on the horse even if it means having a look at that face uh and some stock watch notes too we got we got a loaded pod for the, the middle of january that path does never uh, stops getting paved as you said this is this is as loaded as a mid January fantasy football Absolutely. podcast can be, folks. Um, and yeah, we'll be obviously we'll be talking, we'll be previewing Super Bowl Fifty Three a little more in depth, and we'll be doing our prop bet show. Hopefully, welcoming the Salt Man, even though uh, the Salt Man on on the air, it's a real hit or miss proposition. And we'll then get uh, Keegs you know, back we'll in. We'll get maybe Jimbo. Jimbo's always Jimbo good Slice prop. is a great addict, yeah. addicted gambler. So yeah, absolutely yeah. all of them. Yeah, yeah, he's hooked. <laughs> All right. So anyway, but let's get into it. Let's talk about the championship weekend games. Let the, this is real football we're talking about. Obviously, mm-hmm. some of the players in this recap have fantasy, you know, relevance certainly next year and stuff like that. But anyway, and some guys with some major fantasy relevance didn't show up as well, and that's worth Absolutely. noting. Absolutely, and I, that's right. one of the biggest storylines because it does trickle down to 2019. I think you're referencing number one overall pick, Todd Gurley. Are you not? Uh, he's not only him. I am referencing him. I was also referencing Tyreek Hill. I was also mm-hmm. referencing Mike Thomas to some degree. Uh, these are all like uh, big name guys that didn't do much. Now, when Mike Thomas and Tyreek Hill respectively played the Rams and the Chiefs or and the Patriots during the regular season, I forget their exact numbers. I want to say it was like uh, they, they played two games. It was like Insanity. 19 receptions, 380 yards, four touchdowns combined. Yep. And I think this week it was five catches, 80 yards, no touchdowns. Um, so yeah, th- that's what I was talking about. Todd Gurley, obviously. I mean, that, that's that's the obvious one. The guy barely played. But let's talk about the games. Let's talk about Rams Saints first because I don't want you to, like, blow your load in the first <laughs> half of the recap section. If, if I have anything left. I mean, I'm right, you have nonstop left, I'm sure jackhammering sure myself. you're, like, <laughs> raw and irritable down there anyway. Oh, my poor uh, penis, yeah. <laughs> oh, God. I know, trouble, but, there's, <laughs> but there's a lot of old there's probably a tear or two that left used to, to be white there. that are now kind of a yellowish tinge that are like <laughs> scattered around the apartment. Anyway, uh, <laughs> that's just a guess, just an yes. educated oh, guess. Yes. All right, well, let's talk Saints and Rams. Uh, Rams, obviously, when I want to say the final score is 23 to 20, but maybe it was 26 to 23. But anyway, it was an overtime game. And all anybody is going to be talking about as far as the real game goes is probably the what I would characterize as pretty much the worst no call I've ever seen 
in a big moment like that, you would agree that the Saints got completely hosed, right? Absolutely awful. I don't get how maybe the angle was tough for the guy that was closest, couldn't totally see the ball there. But at some point, one of those refs has to make a call. I mean, he took off his head. Whether he had caught the ball or not, whether it was pass interference or not, the, the hit itself was worthy of a call, never mind the fact that it was blatant pass interference. So absolutely brutal for the Saints. I mean, granted, they had their chances to win. They did, they let that game get to sure. that point. So, like, I totally, you know, I, you never want to say a ref dictated the game because they could have controlled their fate better. But, yeah, that was awful. I mean, all this chatter now about are they going to review pass oh, interference God. in the future? Yeah, what, what, what's I your mean, stance on that? Like, I mean, that's crazy to me, but what do you think? I mean, my instinct is I don't really like it, but I have to say I did. this left me with a really bad taste in my mouth. I mean, I mm. like to think that there is a certain bar – that officiating will at least be at. And I don't even think it has to be a super high bar, but man, oh man. I mean, the the guy, there were multiple different penalties on that play. He got there way early. He never played the ball Mm -hmm. and he speared him with his helmet. And this all happened. And it was so ridiculously obvious that all of those things happened. And for, for there to be no flag on that play, I mean, I don't know that that did cost them the game and, we, and we, we can look back at it and say, yeah, you know, they shouldn't have thrown on first down, uh, you know, when, at the two minute warning or something like that. Yeah, that's all true. And you can yeah. nitpick a game. The fact is, like, if they make the correct call in that situation, the Saints are going to the Super Bowl. By the way, I think the Saints probably a tougher matchup for the Patriots also. Uh, I, I don't hate it. Yeah, no, I don't. at all. <laughs> I'm sure you don't. I I had been going all all playoffs. I've been saying. Uh, Saints will win the Super Bowl, and I thought that if the Patriots played the Saints, that was the Patriots' best chance to get blown out. Yeah. No, um, I, I mean, yeah, it's, in my opinion, similarly, it's like, if if it did become reviewable, I just, one, I don't want games to ever be dictated on a call like this, and, and such a humongous game at that but at the same time, is it worth the can of worms that it would open up to make pass interference suddenly reviewable? Like, clearly this was a 10 out of 10 pass interference, all, all that penalty, whatnot. But what happens with the gray area? What happens when it's like a, a 7? Like, it, yeah, it was probably pass interference, but it wasn't called. Like, is there going to be shades? Of, to me, that can of worms would not be worth the, you know, it's this human error. It's part of the game. It's happened multiple times. People in baseball have had their, you know, perfect games blown off of an ump call and things of that nature. It happens. It sucks. I'd be irate if I was a Saints fan, but at this end of the day, I don't think there's anything you can do. I don't know how you would change it and make it better and not ruin just the pace of the game and, and make challenges just this complete clown I, show moving forward. So I have no I idea. I think I basically yeah. agree with you. That said, who the the person or people responsible for this should probably lose their jobs, and oh, I don't yeah. say it, and I don't say that lightly. I mean, I know these are real people and stuff, but it's like you know. This is this is who's going to the Super Bowl. Like the wrong team's going to the Super Bowl, and everyone uh, knows it. Everyone yeah. knows it. It's the not refs like have admitted a, a it at this point. Yeah, I everyone's mean, admitted it. Everyone yeah. except that coward Goodell, who hasn't gotten up and said anything, which he right. should, but he right. won't. He's like the biggest puss in the world. Absolutely. Anyway, um, yeah, and I mean, like noteworthy in that game, uh, Michael Thomas did not much. Kamara looked like a monster. I have oh, to he's say, he's gonna be such a beast, dude. I thought we, that he was gonna slice the Patriots up completely if they played. But anyway, I mean, and you I saw said, what Damian Williams that. did to us as we're right. about to get to in, in, a, in a few minutes. What would Kamara do? I mean, Damian Williams is solid. He's clearly more impressive okay. than I would have ever given him credit for. But he's not Kamara, so yeah, I don't know. We would have had no answer to him, and nobody has an answer to him. So I'm so excited as we talked about a couple weeks sure ago. You're excited the, not to see Kamara. Oh, uh, very company. excited to not see Kamara. But in general, I'm so excited for his off season too. We talked about the five biggest off season storylines on a couple podcasts ago, yeah. and that was the clear cut number one: is where is Mark Ingram going? Because Alvin Kamara was on pace for 524 fantasy points, the most of all time 60 more than what you know Ladanian Tomlinson did in that historic so who knows what Kamara could do next year it could be legitimately number one overall consideration and that's especially true these days with Todd Gurley what is happening there I definitely want to bring up CJ Anderson hell is going as on, man? maybe the last talking point here for for a couple reasons one 
He's thick as fuck, and I love it. Like I, God, you know, he's me, like a bowling ball. <laughs> I have always been infatuated with thick backs. You know, Michael Tur- mm. Turner, those guys with those bases. I, I mean, I was just like thickness in general, even my woman, but especially in my running backs. And holy shit, he put on some pounds. He already was a thick boy. Uh, I, I just love watching him just run, and he's powerful as fuck. He doesn't as fat as he looks. He's moving and he's doing well. Uh, so one, I love him because he's thick, but two. What does it mean for Gurley if they he's going to be a free agent, C.J. Anderson? But if they sign this guy again, I feel like Gurley would fall at least you know seven to eight spots. You got to assume. I mean, he's on the sideline as much as he what is. Happened, something's, well, let's, something's, let's, it's let's, a knee injury. He's had let's a knee not injury. Even talk, okay, so that's what we're talking about here. Because I mean, let's fantasy value is one thing. I'm curious. I mean, and and I agree with your assessment for whatever it's worth. But why? I want to <laughs> understand what's going on. They're saying, I mean, Gurley himself said after the game, I'm not injured, I was just playing sorry, and C.J. Anderson was the better back. I don't buy that. I mean, it, this is the guy that was in consideration for MVP at some points over the season. He was changing games at that level in Todd Gurley. So C.J. Anderson, as thick and sexy as he is in that sense, is not Todd Gurley. Like, it's not even close. So something's wrong with Gurley. He's hurt. There's no way that he's 100% and they're just deciding to feed C.J. Anderson for some inexplicable reason. Uh, but moving forward, if C.J. Anderson's earned himself a long-term gig in this backfield, yes, I imagine the tides would shift much further back to Gurley come 2019, but C.J. Anderson would be involved at the stripe. He'd be a little bit of a nuisance. I could see him having, you know, 10 carries a game, whereas Gurley was that 30-touch cheat code workhorse for so long. So suddenly, C.J. Anderson's thick ass becomes a situation to monitor for this offseason. Uh, and, and I love watching it, too. <laughs> And, I mean, early consideration for C.J. Anderson for the 2019 Rotor Street Journal Nutcracker set, you'd have to say. I mean, you could see him sliding in and being a Frank Gore replacement. I was going to say Frank Gore, like the (laughs) thick-ass little walnuts. Right, right. The guy that you used to, like, really crack the ones that need some extra oomph behind it. Absolutely, yeah. I'm just saying. They're wearing the uh, lightning blue again this weekend. I didn't love him in the white. I'm excited to see that that body get wrapped in the blue again this weekend. So when talking to you about stuff like this is so great because like there's like nobody else on the planet that would have any idea what I was talking about. <laughs> if I brought that up, it's just like look at him and I'm like, oh, he'd make a good running back walnut cracker yeah, for our set. And like you know, of the seven about. billion people in the world, there's like four that would be like yeah i hear you <laughs> Everyday wolves. Yeah, exactly. right. oh, all man. right let's talk about the patriots and chiefs game oh, I, yes <laughs> i have a couple thoughts on the patriots chiefs uh chiefs game um first point i'm gonna make is um i thought the chiefs would win i thought the patriots deserved to win uh, and and mm. uh after the game I, i'm not one of these like oh they got Screwed. They got. There was one horrendous call on a roughing the passer. Roughing the passer. Oh yeah, uh, that complete. Just, BS. That, that was such a yep. bitch. Call. I, I won't disagree with you. You know, and Brady's a tough guy. He, he was a. That, and so I don't. I don't blame Brady for that. But what a bitch call. Um, I know. Other like than that, I still think the, the Patriots pad, deserve yeah. to win. Um, I want to say this about Andy Reid. What are you doing deferring at the start of the game? Like, to get take the ball, you idiot. Like, I know this is like you know seventy minutes before, like of game time before the end of the game. But I. I that left me with bad vibes the second the game started. I was like, "What's this guy doing?" Uh, absolutely. Like, I mean, give the whole host- ball, you moron! You're gonna like give Brady the ball and let him go eight minutes to start the game, which is like exactly what happened. A hundred percent, what happened? It was so unbelievably sexy to watch us come out that way, uh, just grind off eight minutes, keep Mahomes on the sideline as long as we did, just wear out that pathetic run defense. I mean, if there's one MVP, and yes, I agree fully. You know, the whole game strip going into it was you can't get down early as a Patriot, or else you're screwed because that offense just piles on points, and if you have to abandon your run game and and suddenly they can just put their ears back and blitz you all all day long you're in some trouble with against that defense but thankfully the complete opposite happened we get it we grind it out with you know eight minute drive as you mentioned and that MVP of the, this entire offseason I mean this entire postseason and really the entire year for the Patriots has to be that offensive line I mean as a former lineman myself I just love nothing more than solid line play they I want to been- 
Go ahead. They, I mean, like what I looked at the stats today, zero sacks in the postseason, one hurry, like a, a slight <laughs> hit against the Chargers in a meaningless point of the game. And the running lanes have just been unbelievably gaping. And I love the concept Skarnick is using, uh, you know, the pulling and the clear outs of this. It's unbelievable how big Trent Brown is and how well they use him pulling around the edge and just clearing out linebackers. It's just ridiculous what Skarnicki's created in terms of a blocking scheme here. And it's clear that that, that line has been what's really truly the engine of this ridiculous postseason run. It's been out of this world. Uh, and that's what I think tr- truly is the biggest strength of this team right now. I want to include in that offensive line thing that you're talking about. I want to include Gronk in that. Oh, yeah, because, absolutely. Man, he's a, a great so. blocker. Like, I mean, you know. So fun to watch. He's, he's a really great – I mean, is there a better blocking – tight end out there i mean maybe i, I mean so. I, maybe there is and i and just not high profile enough for me to go but the guy the guy is a legitimately great blocker people can say what they want about gronk uh but he's a team guy he really yeah. is and oh, yeah. uh you know props to him you know even though i was not pulling for the patriots i appreciate excellent football and man he he puts them out there a couple other thoughts Absolutely. on the game um pat mahomes is the is I, I mean i'm the truth but he's also the truth Oh yeah, uh, he's that, the truth. That, that, that guy is, uh, you know, that that guy might be in the Nutcracker set for a while now. A hundred percent. I know. I mean. Y- Yes, it's like, you know, as a Pat Mahomes fan myself, of course I wanted the Patriots to win. I'm so pumped they're going. But you just get the sense that, I mean, he's got 20 more years where we're going to see at least 5 to 10 Pat Mahomes Super Bowls coming. It's It was awesome to watch. I love the fact that Brady went to his locker room after the game, like sought him out for a, a quick oh. chat, like just game recognizing game and Brady knowing, you know, he's the GOAT and Brady will forever be the GOAT. But this Mahomes guy is the real deal. And he's going to put Such up some numbers PR in that rival. Such a by Brady, by the way. I, a, I think Brady... Tr- I think like, Brady I'm genuinely. Sure, I'm sure meant no it. one, no one. Uh, I'm sure no one like slipped to the media that that uh, Brady went and did that. I'm sure Brady wasn't like, hey, uh, by the way, I'm going over to talk to Pat Mahomes. <laughs> if you're gonna give Aaron Rodgers a hard time about being like, oh, my legs like broken, you can't be here and be like, oh yeah, Brady, like what didn't do that, like so he could get his name in the paper. I don't think he did. Why would he? He doesn't need like PR. It's Brady. He already Aaron has Rodgers a, doesn't a, need PR lovely. either. But you accuse him. But he's of a dick. Doing <laughs> but Brady's a dick too. No, Look, Brady's you can, you a can goat. Pull for Brady. He's a hero. You can pull for Brady, and you can think he's the goat, and he might be. Why is he a dick? He, why is Aaron Rodgers a dick? Brady's because he's dick. an awful teammate that throws everybody under the bus outside himself. He has no accountability. He makes sure everybody knows how hurt he is all the time. He's pathetic. He's a loser. Brady doesn't do any of that. He's the ultimate teammate. He rallies his guys. No game's ever over. He doesn't quit on his team or his teammates. He takes pay cuts for his team so they can get guys all the time. There's nothing and, about Brady and he's the great And he's the greatest guy in the world, taking time out of his schedule, going and talking to Pat Mahomes. What a good oh, guy. Oh, yeah. What a great guy. What a good he guy. with his son. Like, he does everything right is <laughs> the best what a good guy oh man uh but the other couple of those two is what a bonehead play by d ford like that offside oh, yeah, i almost forgot about saving, that Jeez. saving us which was amazing uh i thank you d ford yeah, I mean, my, new, my new it. favorite chief <laughs> i love pat mahomes but d ford well if he's really your favorite chief, chief he'll probably be uh, he'll probably uh, be available I, uh, I know he's a free agent this year so we'll see uh, after a 13 sack season i'm sure somebody's gonna forget. yeah i mean he was a good player too man what Absolutely. a dumb what a, it was that was too bad that was horrendous. Um, i mean edelman's back which is obvious and clear to see those third downs in overtime and just in general it, it was sidearm that that mahomes did at one point like they came right in on him there's a i want to say it was hightower was like almost in on him and mahomes just flicks it sidearm like right like right through him pretty much because if he had thrown with a normal motion like he would have knocked it down but like the guy was behind him and Mahomes just kind of flicked it sidearm and it was like a 15 yard gain it was it was just like there's he does it probably all the time. probably no no well he does now he didn't used to but now yeah. like that's like actually in his repertoire he's probably the only quarterback in the NFL who could do that yeah and, I agree 100%. Uh, he's the only one who does do it i mean the the guy's really really good it's hard to pull against him in general um you know it Look out, because it, barring some some unforeseen things, which happen all the time in football, I admit, man, the road to the AFC 
championship is eventually just going to go through Pat Mahomes. It's probably going to become <laughs> exactly what the Patriots have been. I mean, eight straight AFC championship appearances. I don't. You, th- there's no Bill Belichick coaching in Kansas City. No, nah, I mean, Reed, as smart as he is, as great of an offensive mind he is, he is such a bonehead when it comes to late game. Like, 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 so didn't, didn't give his defense a single timeout. Like, let those guys rest. We just kept driving it right down their yeah. throats. It's not like you're going to like be able to take those timeouts with you. You listen to Tony settled. Romo, by the way, just basically uh, like basically like saying everything. exactly what was going to happen on every play and saying that. Like, saying, yeah, like, yeah you should probably call a timeout. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, J- James White's going to have to pass protect so they can hit Edelman over the middle of the oh, field. Sure Gronk's, enough. They're probably going to go to Gronk on the right side this time oh yeah you you know who would have been better coaching the chiefs than andy reed tony romo tony romo knows what the fuck is happening (laughs) clearly yeah no he's he's i've always loved him even since like day one where there's some rough patches and people were shitting on him i think tony romo is unbelievable he's probably the best commentator in the game right now up there at least yeah i think so and I mean, by the way, I think that his stock as a, a quarterback has gone up a lot now that he's <laughs> There's in rumblings that the now, team's people like, are just like, yeah. yeah, he was a pretty great quarterback. And it's like, well, you didn't think that when he was playing quarterback. You thought he sucked. <laughs> anyway. Uh, all right. Let's get into the stock watch. Uh, Patriots, Rams, Super Bowl. Um, I'm just going to say right now, we'll, we'll preview this more going forward. I'm picking the Patriots. Hell yeah. Um, that does the one team of the four. That I would have, I mean, you know, and they beat the Chiefs, so obviously I would have been wrong. But the Rams were the one team of the four I would have picked the Patriots over. Mm-hmm. If they were playing, I would not have picked them over the Saints. I think they're going to beat the Rams. We'll see I what happens. Too. Hell yeah. Um, all right, stock watch. Cardinals have re-signed wide receiver Larry Fitzgerald, who I think is 48 years old, to a <laughs> one-year contract worth $11 million with incentives that could increase the value even more. Absolutely. And, I mean, that's a pretty hefty penny to pay for someone that – you, I mean, coming into the offseason, you wouldn't say they're going to make Larry Fitzgerald the focus of this passing game, but $11 million is right up there in the top 15 or so contracts. It suggests that they're still heavily committed to this guy as a weapon in their offense, and it's going to be a whole new offense. Our guy CJ's writing a great breakdown of Cliff Klingsbury right now, and uh, for all his faults as a coach in terms of abandoning the run game and not having a strong defense at all and never winning more than eight games as a college coach, this guy's coordinated, Cliff has, some of the most explosive offenses have reached the memory. I mean, Pat Mahomes being one of those those leaders, those juggernauts who was developed underneath Kingsbury. So I'm really excited to see what Fitz can do in this last maybe hurrah, this ride off into the sunset. Every single year he's too old and he's that unsexy pick that nobody wants and you find him in round... I mean, in our mock draft, I got to think round 10 and that was before we knew he was fully coming back out of retirement. This is a guy that consistently puts up quality wide receiver two numbers, if not low end one numbers, and now he's going to be in the best scheme he's been in and since Bruce Arians was there. So I'm very excited for what this means, Larry Fitz coming back and the draft value he's likely to present yet again. Do you think that Cliff Kingsbury is going to throw the ball to uh, David Johnson or you think he's just going to be like, fuck it? So, I mean, that's where you see all these like coaching trends. And as you know us, we are as diehard into digging into coaching schemes and trends and all those philosophy stuff. I don't think any site does it more than us. But there are some you have to take with a grain of salt. So you can look and say, you know, Kingsbury running backs, no one ever caught more than 40 passes under him while he's at Texas A&M. But if he's as bright of an offensive mind as I think yeah, he, he didn't is, have David proven, Johnson when he, he didn't have David Johnson. A&M. Right. Exactly. So it's although again, I, isn't it? Isn't it? We, we had this argument last time. Isn't it Texas Tech, not Texas? A&M. No, it's A&M, I think, right? Yeah, no, didn't it's 100% my, A&M. You thought it was Tech. It's A it's No, A&M. I said it was Tech. It's it's A&M. I'm 99% isn't that, sure. Is that where Patrick Mahomes played? Is it yeah, tech? He, Kingsbury. No, no, he was Pat Mahomes was A&M, wasn't he? Look, look it up. I'm I'm look. looking it up as we as we speak. But that's look, the one, you know, I, I, I like big, to This is on the big board. <laughs> Kingsbury. I'm, I'm looking it up right now. Uh but what I was trying to get at with the coaching thing, you know, there's some camps out there. I think there's two very hardcore camps where there's like people that just read every single stat and correlation, and they they draw these these lines that you know Bruce Arians has never used a tight end, so suddenly OJ Howard's stock is is you got to kill it, and it's never going to happen. Um, and then there's guys that are like coaching correlation; it's all traps. Like there's nothing to ever learn from schemes. And I lean more to the the side of there's a lot to learn from the schemes, and there's a lot to learn about the philosophy and what 
they've done in the past production of certain players, especially when you can draw parallels to the talents and the way they've been used in the past. If there's like similar skill sets like Antonio Gates thriving under Frank Reich for so many years, and then you saw it with the Eagles, with Zach Ertz, like we should have known Eric Ebron was going to catch a shitload of touchdowns because that's always been the case with Frank Reich. And we talked about Frank Reich using the title in quite a bit. We were just higher on the, the beanstalk himself naturally. Um, but th- that's kind of my camp is will, you know, all these people, David Johnson stocked down. He only clicked, you know, Kingsbury's only thrown to the running back 40 times in a year. I don't buy that. He's never had a guy like David Johnson. He's already come out and said, this guy's going to be the focal point of our attack. We've got to get him the ball in creative ways. Uh, I think he will be able to get him the rock. I just need him to have an offensive line. I mean, they, their offensive line is so embarrassingly bad that I still can't get too excited about David Johnson if he's going to be running into a brick wall the entire day. All right, agreed on that. And I just want to say for the second episode in a row, Pat Mahomes went to Texas Tech, which I also <laughs> which I also explained to you I, I think I've gotten it wrong three, which you were just row, like yeah. which you were just like no it's A&M and I mean I was shocked to have to set you straight on that once but certainly two episodes in a row uh, fuck. <laughs> if I set you straight in episode five like we might have to look for a, a new I'll seat officially of, accepted um, big, big bet boards I, I'm sure the salt man is just going crazy right now he's, going, he's gonna kill me yeah we do have to have like that third little weirdo in the corner that's just like stat corrections at the end of the episodes uh. <laughs> so perfect for that. Yeah, the wolf being a moron, that little brain. Shut the fuck up, CJ. <laughs> All right, ESPN's Adam Schefter confirms that multiple teams are interested in signing free agent running back Cream Hunt. It's not doesn't really come as a surprise, right? Of course, it's a very talented guy and a very cost controlled Super young a contract. Very young, featured back, led the league in rushing, and was on pace to be in the contention for it at least yet again. So, of course, there's going to be some interest in him, despite the awful incident that happened earlier this off season. I mean, earlier in the in the regular season, uh, some rumored teams already. The Bears. He's got that history with Matt Nagy, who was of course with the Chiefs just two seasons ago when he led the league in rushing. So that would be an interesting potential fit. Um, who knows what the chef didn't really mention who else there, there could be involved with. So that's the only dot that's really been connected so far. And it's an easy one to draw, but we'll see. They still are saying that his suspension has been determined, but it will be determined before the season. I'd hope so. I mean, we've got plenty of time to decide that between now and then. Uh, so that will obviously play a factor. And is he out for half a season? Um, and if so, you know, what type of situation are you expecting out of cream hunt? But of course, this becomes a must track situation, if only because wherever he lands, like that backfield is going to become a mess at some point that season. So, Cream Hunt, very interesting storyline that that we all got to monitor at this point. What's your What's your dream team for him to go to? Mm, I mean, it's tricky because again, I mean, taking all out, the character issues out and everything, I'm just talking football. I, I would say. Uh, I mean, it's tough because he's going to only be coming in for, you know, half a season or so, like we were just saying. So I don't want him to go muddy up like, you know, the Colts would be a great offense for him. But then, you know, Marlon Mack, I want him to get hot and have a nice season. Well, like the Texans. Yeah, the te- I mean, the Texans would be awesome because by week, that's actually the perfect one because that's, you know, by week eight, Lamar Miller's already crumbling. You're already seeing the old man, like, you know, that guy's just already a plotter and he just gets more plotter-ish by, by the time the midseason rolls around. I think that would be a perfect fit. Yeah, I think that's that's ideal. That's the top ro- uh, value hole that makes sense for a cream hunt. All right, we're going to get into the mock draft real quick. Now, n- none of these are legally binding, anything like that. I'm going to go down the third round, and I'm just going to tell you, starting with the first pick, going down to the 12th, I'm going to read them off, and then we're each going to say maybe a guy that jumps out at us. If you got two or something like that you want to talk about, I'm fine with you having my airtime, but if a guy jumps out at me, I'll say so. All right, pick number one. Um, And a lot of these picks were made under duress, I want to point out, but it's still not a bad skeleton for you guys to base some things on. Darius Geis. Have you forgotten Darius Geis? Remember, we we were so high. A lot of people uh, so high on him. That was a heartbreaker in the preseason. Darius Geis, followed by Zach Ertz, Stefan Diggs, Mike Evans, Keenan Allen, Chris Carson, T.Y. Hilton, Aaron Jones, Derek Henry. Talk about a guy that <laughs> back from the scrap heap. Oh, my gosh. Mm-hmm. Um, Damian Williams, Carrion Johnson, Leonard Fournette. Hugely, hugely running back heavy round. I mean, I think we had seven RBs. Four wide receivers and then Ertz at tight end. Anybody in that group that really jumps out at you that you want to talk about for a minute? 
I think there's a ton of intrigue here. I think Ertz was probably the best in terms of just a high floor, high ceiling at such a huge position of need at tight end. So I thought CJ did really well to learn that guy in round three. I, I project him as a second rounder for sure. Uh, a guy, I, I mean, the guy I got, I really love, especially now that Matt LaFleur is there, is Aaron Jones. Uh, such an explosive talent yeah. that has been misused for years. You know, he's only been in the league for two seasons. But Mike McCarthy has been a complete bonehead with this guy. I mean, they're, they're, last year he only had 15-plus carries in three games. They were 2-1 in one of those games versus 2-7 in seven in the games where he had fewer than 15. Uh, thankfully, Matt LaFleur, very run-heavy scheme. We'll get into a really nice breakdown of him at some point. But very run-heavy scheme. His whole offense is about marrying the run and pass games, and you have to have a strong run game to do that. So the last three offensives he's, he's been a part of have all been in the top 10 or so uh, in terms of run-pass percentage. They very run heavy uh top three in rushing yards with the falcons top five with the, the rams so very productive offense we saw you know henry obviously take over um late season and a second run heaviest scheme uh with the titans last year so a lafleur offense has had a lead back touch the ball 15 plus times 87 percent of the time so whereas aaron jones has hovered around like 30 percent of the time getting 15 plus touches and he's averaged uh, his pace with he's got 15 plus touches. I did it out is 1,766 total yards and 18 touchdowns, which would have been the RB five in fantasy this last year. Uh, so I think he's just set to explode because the volume's going to spike. I think the system in terms of zone blocking and screen heavy is great for Aaron Jones. I'm about to go all in on Aaron Jones. So the fact that I got him in the middle of round three, when I now kind of project him as a, a fringe second rounder, uh, I thought was fantastic value. But I would have even taken T.Y. Hilton, who went the pick before me, uh, before Aaron Jones. I thought that was an I thought T.Y. Too. was probably, I mean, you know, the steal of that round. I don't know about the steal. Maybe Ertz was. But T.Y. Hilton seems uh, pretty undervalued, given that the Colts are trending up the way they are. And the, the guy was hurt much of the year. It seemed mm-hmm. like he still put up pretty good numbers. And the, uh, the one... You- Go ahead. What's that? I was going to say the one guy I also would love to touch on is Damian Williams because he's going to be one of the picks that he's not going to round three. It's either going to be he shoots up at least a round because he's the clear-cut Chiefs guy. Right. In my Two opinion, he'd be, a, he'd be like a fringe first rounder, right, at the, the bottom of round one if he is that clear-cut Chiefs guy. Right now he is. I mean, we've seen what he's been producing, six touchdowns over his last four games. He's been the RB2 over that span. This guy's been an absolute monster since he got the opportunity and he's looked really good. Of course, he's a product of the most explosive offense in the league. I'm not going to pretend like Damian Williams is elite talent, but if he's that lead guy in this unbelievable situation, there's no doubt at this point he can get it done and he can get it done with serious volume. So he's a guy that I think could be a steal right there for Heggs, or he could go crumble if they sign Mark Ingram and then Damian Williams is just the backup. So he's the guy that I would say out of this round is like the most you must monitor style guy. Is there anybody else you want to touch upon that? I mean, I was just going to ask you, do you, th- you think Derrick Henry is just going to break a bunch of people's hearts next year? I mean, I get why he's high on this know, list, but it's man. like, come on. I mean, like, like you, you can't feel too good picking the guy in the third round. Like, and, and it's like, you might be getting a real steal. You really might. Like he might right. be a first round guy, but like you can't feel confident, right? It's, it's hard to. I mean, obviously he exploded and looked like a different running back, like genuinely looked like a different running back over that late season stretch. He claims, you know, Eddie George fired him up. I don't know how much of that you need to buy. I'm sure other coaches were telling him, hey, you're not finishing your run. Stop running like a little bitch. But hey, for whatever reason, he says Eddie George was the one that lit the fire. And he clearly was running like a man possessed down the stretch run there. So if he got that type of workload, then round three would be an unbelievable steal. He'd be a, a depend. He should be a first rounder. He was the number one running back from weeks 13, you know, the fantasy playoffs. He was unbelievable. But yes, you're, you're dead right that how could you feel good? I mean, it's definitely going to make you squeamish no matter how much upside they have. Would love him as like a second or even, you know, running back, running back, running back stable type of guy as your, your second or third. Comes with tremendous upside, but... Yeah, it's tough to feel great about it. Who is this Arthur Smith offensive coordinator they just hired? Was their tight end coach, so maybe he's more of a grinder. I don't know. Pure speculation there. Uh, but here, I think it makes sense. I think towards the middle of the third round, the the risk is awful. Bottom barrel, you know, zero floor. But the ceiling is top you know, five running back overall. So right. this makes sense to me, and I, I think that's a solid value for Roto JT. 
Yeah, I don't think it was a bad pick. I just would be cringing. That's all. And I am cringing. We'll see what happens. I like the receivers that fall in this, too. I mean, Keenan, Mike Evans, T.Y. Hilton, all of those guys, I'd be very comfortable. Diggs, who you took. I I think that I like the other three a little bit more than Diggs, who you took over them. Uh, But any of those guys I'm okay with is my number one, which is, again, why I love that running back, running back strategy. If this is what I'm going to have available to me at, at wide receiver, I'm all in on going running backs early. All right, let's go down to the fourth round. Uh, we still got good players in the fourth round. It was really we're going to stop after the sixth because after that it just becomes a shit pile. But yeah. anyway, the fourth round: uh, AJ Green, Robert Woods, Sony Michelle, Philip Lindsay, Devontae Freeman, James White, Tariq Cohen, George Kittle, Marlon Mack, Doug Baldwin, Jarek McKinnon, Jordan Howard. I mean, all all solid players there. I mean, there's a few that that give me pause, but I mean, these are all these are all guys you still want on your fantasy team, right? A hundred percent. I mean, I'm very impressed with this entire round. Outside of Jordan Howard, I think that pick just makes me want to throw no, up. Maybe I'm biased. Uh, but when you look at the next few picks of the fifth round, you'll see like Jordan Howard over these guys. I, I hate that pick by Duck. I just hate Jordan Howard because he ruined my season in many leagues. Uh, sure. So fuck you, Jordan Howard. Very nice public service announcement for him. But other than that, I thought this this round was completely littered with talent. The only real unknown there is Jarek McKinnon, who could be a top 10 back. We were all in on this guy and his fit in the Shanahan scheme till he got hurt. So I loved everything about this. I thought George Kittle in particular by Keegs. I thought I mean, Kittle I went, was a great pick. I, I went Travis Kelsey in round two. And if I had known Kittle would be falling to not only round three, but round four, I would never have get, gone Kelsey there. And I love Kelsey and I don't hate my pick by any means outside of the fact that Kittle fell to 44. I mean, that is an elite edge. This guy set the yardage record for tight ends this last year and is going into round four. And now he gets Jimmy Garoppolo, a better quarterback back. Maybe Antonio Brown goes there and takes off some heat, makes this offense more explosive. The best might be yet to come for Kittle. So for Keegs to get him there, I thought was absurd. I also love Philip Lindsay. Uh, Me I mean, too. I think he's a great back for the Broncos. The guy they hired, um, it was the 49ers ex quarterbacks coach. So he comes from gr- being groomed under Shanahan, similar to like that LaFleur, Shanahan, McVay zone blocking scheme. Lindsey's perfect for that. His feet rapid fire out of nowhere. So, you know, once he finds the path, and he's great, great vision, finds the holes really well. So I can just picture him gliding through a zone blocking scheme and then right turning that corner and bursting. I mean, I just think he's going to be a perfect fit for, for a zone blocking scheme. So, I think Lindsey really fell. Uh, AJ Green, I mean, I know he gets the foot injuries every year, but this is AJ Green. He was a top six receiver till he went down. I know. So to get him in round four, I just I think there's tons of value. I'm really excited about what's falling in drafts. I actually don't like my Devonta Freeman pick all that much. Uh, Dirk Cutter, not great for running backs. He hadn't been hired yet. Um, that was one of the picks I didn't like. Was my own honestly, pick. your pick and my pick and, and Jordan Howard, I thought were all terrible. <laughs> I don't hate. I don't hate Doug Baldwin though. I thought you Devontae, took, right? I, I don't hate him. All right, terrible is a stretch. Yeah. I mean, it, I I can't I can't pick under this format. Uh, but anyway, uh, I, I thought Freeman was a lousy pick. I, also, I'm sketched out by the Jarek McKinnon pick from mm-hmm. CJ. It's like, it's not like I don't get it, but I mean, you know, it's a mock who cares, right. but uh, you know, it's not like you couldn't get burned by that. The one I love the James white pick. I have to I, say. I, fantastic. I mean, this guy was a running back. Joe Hopkins is playing versus... his playing chess. We're all playing checkers. Joe Hopkins had a fantastic. He's, yeah. Game. He's the and one I who got Keegs you did also. I mean, yeah, Keegs, Keegs when you look at his team, I was like, Holy fucking shit. After round four, I, I his, and he just keeps getting better. So I liked yeah. all those. Uh, the one thing with Freeman that I will say is Tevin Coleman is a free agent, so it could become a, a Freeman workhorse. Free, show. But Freeman might, but Freeman's. I think he might be done. Like I mean, uh, I yeah. you know I I looked at him and he doesn't pass the eye test to me, and it's like I just I, he looks kind of like a washed up running back to me. So we will see, I, yeah. I'm not interested in Freeman. Um, round five, Brandon Cooks, Kenny Galladay, Cooper Cup, Julian Edelman all came after the Jordan Howard pick. Um, then Mark Ingram, Tyler Lott. I'm going to pause you for one second because to me that like that Mark Ingram pick from there on it was like night and day to me in my opinion what happened to the fantasy talent like I was want. sitting there and I was like oh my god you know through round five we still got Kenny Galladay a potential target hog Cooper Cup was the number two receiver in fantasy until he Cup got pick. it I love that pick I was so pissed that you took him I mean Edelman you clearly see he and Brady are still on another level chemistry wise I was sitting there like oh my god I'm gonna get one of the Rams you know whether it's Cooks whether it's Cup or Edelman sitting here in round five because I hadn't taken a receiver yet so I was stoked and then all three of those guys went. Ingram went. Galladay's gone. 
and the talent drop off was stark. So you're gonna read off the na- the next names, I know. But I just wanted to point it out that like when you get to pick fifty ish mid round five, the drop off is like catastrophic. So just keep that in mind. No, I'm with you. I agree. Um, all right, Mark Ingram, Tyler Lockett, OJ Howard. I mean, hey, this is demonstrating what you were saying. Yep. Alshon Jeffrey, Eric Ebron, Emmanuel Sanders, Jarvis Landry, and Andrew Luck. I mean, right. lock a solid quarterback. I'm not trying to take a quarterback in the fifth round when pretty much <laughs> after, after Mahomes, like it seems like they're all interchangeable right now. A hundred percent, yeah. They, I mean, as we were already b- breaking down, the top of that round was such a, a tier. Like it seems like it's almost three tiers above what was going right after it. So it, to me, that makes one. It's clear it's an advantage to be at the top of the draft. So when, when it comes round five, you're still picking from a very talented pool. Uh, so I love all those first five picks up to Keegs, where it gets Mark Ingram, like the upside if that guy goes to the Chiefs for example Mark Ingram would be a fringe first rounder so love that type of style if you're doing best ball take that plunge on Mark Ingram a a true every down back that seems likely to be out of New Orleans and get himself a featured role after that like who did I like beyond those clear cut five studs I I mean I don't know honestly I like OJ Howard he was doing real solid things till he got hurt but, like, you know, Sanders was obviously a monster, but then tore his Achilles. So, is he going to be the same guy? No. Sean Jeffrey had some <laughs> no, monster. No, he's not going to be the same guy. I mean, I don't hate my <laughs> Jeffrey pick, to be honest, once Tate was. Uh, no, I don't hate your Jeffrey pick, but yeah, I, he was I, dominating I don't think it's like a great there. pick, though. No, he's my number one receiver. I feel disgusting about it. So, you know, yeah, to me, it was clear. The clear takeaway with round five is like once you get to past the middle point and you hit like the Tyler Lockett range, you're in for some fucking trouble. Yeah, I agree. All right, let's go to round six. Um, Hunter Henry. Love it. <laughs> Lamar Miller. Uh, uh, Gronk. Tevin Coleman. Calvin Ridley. That's who you're rounding out your receiving core. You're going You're going. Uh, <laughs> Alshon, te- Tevin Coleman at the top. Oh, you, uh, Alvin, deserve, yeah, you deserve Ridley. whatever happens to you. Yeah. Mar- <laughs> Marvin Jones, Sammy Watkins, Allen Robinson, Dante Pettis, Mike Williams, Robbie Anderson, Corey Davis. And uh, this is noteworthy because uh, come like seventh round or so, I had no idea who to pick because this uh, stupid program we were using didn't like have a big board or anything like that where people right. are like still up there. And so the wolf and I would have these heated back and forths on text where he'd just be like, just pick someone. I was like, I don't know who to pick. I don't know who's there. And then he would just, he would like roll his eyes and be like, come on, you moron. And then he would like <laughs> lay out like six receivers. And I remember this because he laid out six receivers. And I was like, after he had like lectured me about this and he's like gave me a bunch and then I was like, all right, Alan Robinson. And then he goes, actually, Robinson's already been paid. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> just like you just lost all your moral high ground. Oh, you shit. Anyway, uh, that, that's the sixth round. And you can see like you're, you're straight. You got some high upside potential guys, but I mean, you're scraping the bottom of the barrel now. Right, exactly. This is where you're, where I turn on my Jets to just chase pure upside. That's why I go with a guy like Calvin Ridley, uh, who Dirk Cutter could use to perfection. He back when he used to be with the Falcons, they had monster seasons out of both Roddy White and Julio Jones. And I think Calvin Ridley, such a physical specimen, could take that next step. You're looking at guys like Mike Williams. I like that pick from you, Truth. Uh, you touchdown hey. machine this last year, and if he rounds out his game just a little bit more. I think if he gets that consistent yardage flow to go with the touchdown upside, he could develop into that low-end wide receiver uh, one-style play. Robbie Anderson obviously drips in potential if him and Darnold keep that connection. Uh, Corey Davis was a target hog for stretches, but you know how much I fucking hate that guy. So yeah, this is just like... It's good to know now already that once you hit round six, you should be just chasing the highest possible ceilings. And that's why I love like the Hunter Henry pick. I fucking love that could be that next, you know, top three, four tight end that ranks alongside Kittle and Ertz and those guys that you can find in round six. I don't think there's going to be a ton of them this year, but I think Hunter Henry does drip in that style of upside. So I I did like that the the staff, the Roto staff crew, all these picks that you just riled off seem to be like people are chasing upside. So the Wolves have been trained quite well that they already know, all right, there's no floors anymore. Let's go after the highest possible ceilings. Yeah, and I like, even though it was very haphazard, my picking in the first six rounds, I do like the fact that I landed a receiving core without a, without a specific alpha dog. But I did end up, uh, at the end of the day, having Stefan Diggs, Doug Baldwin, Mike Williams, and Cooper Cup. Mm-hmm. And I think they're all solid and all have, like, pretty substantial upside. So I felt pretty good about that. Not not nailing one of the absolute studs in the first two rounds. I felt like I rounded that up pretty well. Now I would have to I'm gonna have to find a tight end. 
which, I mean, I basically punted on that position. Um, and quarterback, I mean, by the way, folks, quarterback, you guys, we, we come in I mean, seventh round. I mean, who who is gone at this point? I think Luck is gone, and I think Mahomes is gone, and that's it. So yeah. if you're reaching on a quarterback before that, you're nuts in my opinion. I mean, you ended up getting, I was just looking through the rest of the draft, you got Jack Doyle in round nine. Yeah. I don't hate that. I mean, this guy was no, catching I don't hate it. six, seven it. balls a game while he was healthy. It's the Frank Reich scheme. I get Ebron's going to be vulturing touchdowns and whatnot, but Jack Doyle, a, a monster when he's out there on the field. I think and just, just ter- hung like a donkey, too. Yes, Let's not forget. Jack Doyle, the beanstalk. He didn't get that nickname because he's got a fucking, like, peep on between the legs. He didn't get that nickname legs. because of his green thumb. He got it <laughs> no. because of his oversized penis. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> I just thought it out those of you at home that didn't get what we were the what we were hinting at there. Of course, um, <laughs> but I've, a few picks that I just I, I'm intrigued by later. I thought Kenyon Drake in the middle of round seven, such a great talent. Like at the right coach, we still don't know who's calling plays there. He could really blow up uh, as a seventh rounder. I like Will Fuller. I How like about Tyler Boyd. Fitzgerald, late ninth. Yep, I got Larry Fitz real late ninth. I love that with Kingsbury now there. Uh, Christian Kirk went above him, and I think Kirk has some huge upside. He's a much more vertical threat, and Kingsbury loves the air raid style from Texas Tech uh, offense over there. So I think Kirk is an interesting sleeper. I, I, there's lots of just interesting. I love Jimbo's pick of Evan Ingram late late eight. We saw late season what we thought we were going to see all year from Ingram, and that was just dominating in the intermediate uh, range and becoming a true target hog. So I think Jimbo might have landed himself a true tight end one in round eight. But then there's obviously some Jimbo some also landed Deshaun Watson at the very end of the ninth round. Un- unbelievable, yeah. The quarterback. That's my death. point about the quarterback thing. It's like in the ninth round we had Philip Rivers, we had Russell Wilson, we had Deshaun Watson in the ninth round. So right. if you're like reaching for Andrew Luck in the fifth round you're stupid in my opinion exactly a lot of people have been hitting me up too like you know you are all in on Mahomes who's going to be your Mahomes of 2019 Mahomes is uh, well yes Mahomes Mahomes again 2019 is going to be his Pat Mahomes but you know how depressing that is too to know like I probably won't own Mahomes in a single draft he went number 10 overall in this draft and I never will take a quarterback above the top 30 so that's I mean that's depressing to know I probably will never own Mahomes again in his entire career so this was a joy this was a true blessing uh, but who could do it this year? And there's not a clear-cut guy, but as you just pointed out, Jimbo getting Watson in late round nine, I mean, Watson was our number one clear-cut number one quarterback coming into the year, and not without reason. We saw plenty of those 30-point games this season, the rushing upside, you know, you got Hopkins, Fuller, and now Kiki Cutie really emerging. I think uh, if they get that line just a little bit more beefed up, and you get the full weapons cabinet, and let's say Fuller can finally fucking stay healthy for once, Watson would be and and, and it's not I know but still Watson in round 9 I thought Jimbo made an unbelievable pick there Uh, and that that is probably going to end up being that quarterback alongside Baker Mayfield who I took the next round who was the quarterback 6 ever since Freddie Kitchens took over this guy his paces uh, with Freddie Kitchens without Freddie Kitchens are out of this world different Uh, so I like Baker Mayfield and Watson like if I can pair those two up as a quarterback duo I know last year You'd definitely be able to. 9 10. And you can always find Philip Rivers late if not. You know, I'm always a big fan of an upside guy in Philip Rivers because you got that safe floor. Uh, and Matt Ryan falling to round 10. I mean, this was the quarterback three this year. So, yes, I don't like that luck pick early round six. When you look at some of these quarterbacks falling, you look at the guys going around them Latavius Murray, TJ Yeldon, Herndon, you know, just no names. Giovanni Bernard, for Christ's fucking oh, sake. Oh, God. Like, remember what I, you remember what I had to say about G- Giovanni Bernard. Oh yeah! What was it like? Anybody who drafts him should just be fucking murdered or something of that right, nature. It like, was. It was. I think it was something <laughs> more eloquent than that. But that was the gist. Yes. Right. I think um, it had something to do with that. They shouldn't be able to play fantasy football. Like they should be banned from fantasy football for life. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway. Yeah. And then uh, two last just names as I'm just scrolling through the list because people do best ball drafts right now. Uh, who's a huge upside? You know, beyond round ten and beyond. I like your pick of Alex Collins. He's a restricted free agent, so it seems like the Ravens have no interest in keeping this guy. I think he's pretty talented, uh, so I'd be intrigued to see where he goes. I really do. Uh, like uh, Deshaun Jackson, who it, Bruce Arians is trying to his, do his damnedest to keep this guy and Bruce Arians such a vertical scheme. I think that could be a glove like fit. He's falling around you know, 11, 12. I think he could be a good best ball guy for sure. Uh, and then I also really like, where's the last guy that had just caught my eye and I was glimmer? Um, oh, fuck, I just lost him. 
Uh, Cutie, the guy we were just talked about. He was Kiki an absolute Cutie. Mo- Kiki Cutie. Him and Geronimo Allison, two receivers that I'd be taking a ton of in, in late round best ball with some huge upside uh, coming in 2019. So those are just some of the late, late sleepers I really love from this draft. But overall, really just, I mean, a pain in the ass a lot of the draft was because I had to be fucking pulling teeth to get people to make a pick. Because it is January. I get it. I'm psycho. Uh, but it had nothing to do with January. It, had, it was the, I'm telling the you, system the, the crappy program. Like we, we do that with like a ESPN or Yahoo like we normally do. We could have done that in two hours and one night. I know. I wish. Anyway, uh, so but that, either but way, I still feel your pain. I think it is definitely invaluable to see some of these rises and falls. No, come around mid five. You're just trying to start taking your upside stabs and things like that. Like a lot of these trends, sure. Some players are going to rise and fall quite a bit with free agency developments and the draft and all that stuff. This is not set in stone by any means, but you can still get a very good sense of like where these talent pools are going to drop off and where you need to get in your receiver game before it becomes far too late. And you're getting going out with Alshon Jeffrey and Calvin Ridley. Like me, little lessons, like that are very apparent already this early so i loved it i think this hopefully is as valuable to to you listeners as it was for us to do all right folks that was a nice uh comeback podcast episode four yeah, of the hell season. yeah that was good good to get back on the horse we'll be back Love next it. week we promise at least once uh mm. because the super bowl obviously prop bet, baby. super bowl stuff and prop bet stuff coming up so we'll be uh joined by the saw man and jimbo and maybe keegs and maybe joe we'll see what happens um Sounds anyway good, you got any social media you want to pump of course, you can find our main page, rotostreetjournal.com. We got socials for it everywhere Instagram and Facebook, Roto Street Journal, Roto ST Journal on Twitter. Me personally, Roto Street Wolf on Twitter and Snapchat. Love talking football all day, every day. So hit me up whenever you can, whenever you want to talk about. You know I'm there to, to chat with you. Uh, it just, yeah, if you like what you heard, review, subscribe. It means the world to us to hear from you guys, especially the, the hardcore guys that are listening right now in, in you know, mid January. The 2018 2019 season isn't even in the books, and you're still already preparing for the next year. That's who we love. That's who we're trying to build this wolf pack with. That's our so, lifeblood, man. Absolutely. That, it's the best. It's our oxygen. So, thank you so much for tuning in already. We're going to keep paving that path from now to the when you're holding that trophy come next year. This is the best. So, th- thanks again for tuning in this early, guys. All right. My name is Nat the Truth Jones. And I'm the wolf. See you guys. Go, Pats. Later. All right, shoot me a description sometime tonight. Yep. Uh, I'm not going to like rush to get it out like in the next hour, but I'll get Makes it out sense. this evening. Got it. Yeah, I'll get it. I mean, it. I'll get it out. I'll probably put it out by like eight o'clock or something like that. Sounds good, brother. All right, man. All right, good good catching up. up. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Cheers, See you, man. man.